Are we okay? <clears throat> Good morning, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the Foreign Correspondent Club of Japan. My name is Pio D'Emilia. I am this club uh, professional activities committee co-chair, and I'm moderating today this important press conference by our guest speaker, Sergei Korsunsky, ambassador and uh, plenipotentiary of Ukraine to Japan. We have already bell welcomed him a uh, couple of weeks ago, months, I guess. Yeah, months, a month ago. 26th of January. A month has already passed. <laughs> um, a month ago, and uh, he was uh, uh, talking about the risk of uh, open conflict, a war, in other words, in uh, Ukraine. And uh, I think he was right because now we are under such a situation. So we, as a Foreign Correspondent Club, we asked uh, him and the Russian ambassador to both come and uh, actually the Russian ambassador will come in the afternoon at two o'clock so we can have uh, a fair and, uh, and uh, a double point of view of the situation. But let's start with uh, the, our Ukrainian guest. Um, I guess uh, we don't need to introduce him and we don't need to update you all, since you are all journalists, you know what is going on, even the latest, latest news. Uh, for those who are, uh, didn't follow it this early morning, Kishida, Prime Minister of Japan, uh, had held a press conference early morning and announced the new and very strict sanctions against Russia. So, Mr. Ambassador, the microphone is yours. Please uh, have your introduction, then we will start with uh, Q&A from the floor and online. May I ask you please to check your phone, uh, to put it on silent or turn it off, please. Thank you very much. Minasan Konnichiwa. Thank you very much for inviting me. Uh, those are very difficult days. We don't sleep, as you may imagine, for 48 hours minimum. Uh, but let me first begin with a small presentation. I will show you, uh, I'm try, I'll try to explain what's going on. I will show you some exclusive pictures, first ever. Uh, I will tell you at this moment. And if you want, uh, you can then use those pictures. We leave here the uh, file with all of them uh, for your uh, uh, reportage. Uh, when you deal with diplomats, normally you expect that they are very, you know, sober people, um, but it is very difficult to be impartial uh, those days. That is why we begin from, uh, I will show you this very small, uh, ro uh, like, movie. Uh, it's, uh, uh, it's live communications between Russian Navy and uh, our uh, Marines and bodyguards on a very small island. It's like Senkaku, very small one in the Black Sea, where we have had uh, a post. That's a picture. The name of this island is Zmiini, Snake Island in uh, translation into English. So that communication uh, now became uh, a symbol of uh, resistance. Uh, please uh, put the, push the button. I'm 
все. Я же нахуй тоже. На всякий случай. I will translate it to you. Russian Navy says that you have to lay down your weapons, you have to give up, otherwise you will be destroyed. They repeated this two times. The answer was, go fuck yourself. Those people were killed in a brutal attack. In our tradition, we remember those who were killed with uh, a sign of silence. I would like you to ask you to rise and to remember those people. It's amazing. Please do it. They deserved it because they lost their lives for you too. You can imagine 25 people with just so simple weapons against two military ships of Russia. They were just shelled with Russian military... They all killed. What, they, did they bomb or...? What? Of course. They erased all of these structures on the island and they killed everybody. <coughs> and this was when? Yesterday. Yes. This night. Uh, mm. This island is like 2,000 kilometers from Donbass. When you'll be listening to Galuzin today, he will, in nice, good Japanese language probably, will tell you that we are not assaulting Ukraine. It is not, it is not a war. Uh, we are just uh, doing business about Donbass. So let's um, move forward and I will show you what they are doing in Donbass. This is territory of Ukraine. Those are... Uh, what? Next one, yes. This is, uh, this is not all, uh, like, targets on territory of uh, Ukraine. This is just part of them. This is first targets which were assaulted with cruise missiles. Uh, and uh, that was like in 5 a.m. in the morning, people were woke up with the sound of uh, coming missiles. Uh, they bombed first all military installations, airports, uh, all military units, uh, they uh, have had in their, as, as their targets. Later on, uh, they began to bomb civil uh, installments. But that is an uh, important map, because the next one will show you where is Donbass, actually. That is Donbass. Uh, you see dark side, that is... Uh, which is now, uh, it, it was before 24, uh, 21st of February, it was occupied territory. And you see the whole administrative part, uh, two, two administrative regions of Ukraine, we call Donbass together, that's Donetsk and Lugansk uh, 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 regions. Uh, and that is another OSCE uh, map showing uh, the separation line where they, uh, prior to invasion, Prior to 31st of February, they were targeting uh, civil installments and our forces on this border uh, purposefully to create casus belli. Uh, when they realized that uh, we are not responding, there is none, they uh, began a very big attack, information attack, uh, uh, disinformation attack, uh, resulted in this chain of events. As we understand now, it was well prepared long ago, minimum for three months. They were carefully crafting what is going on today. So imagine those three months, enormous diplomatic activities, summits, discussions, visits, uh, President Macron, Chancellor uh, of Germany, uh, so many dignitaries in Moscow trying to talk to Putin and try to find a solution. At that time, Putin already had all this on his, on his table. He was already prepared for an attack. A draft of documents were prepared, so everything was ready. So he was making fool about those uh, dignitaries. So that's they call Donbass, but I show you the map, another map that targets uh, are on the whole territory of Ukraine. So that is where invasion began. From those, uh, plaza, in, I don't know how uh, 
base base places uh, on from actually from three sides, including Belarus, Belarus. Uh, so it was uh, the minimum minimum problem we have had in Donbas, uh, because uh, uh, that was the strongest uh, line of defense against Russian forces. They know they knew it. That is why they began to attack us from all other sides. Uh, because uh, uh, the defensive there uh, was a little bit weaker. For example, uh, on this separation line there are minefields uh, to prevent uh, 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 unexpected attacks. And those minefields set by both sides. Uh, so on other part of Ukraine, of course, we do not have minefields. So you can attack at your will. So that's where they began. Uh, I would like to draw your attention specifically and purposefully. Once months ago, I told you all about the danger of nuclear infrastructure in our territory. And now the worst we expected happened. They say it's Chernobyl nuclear power plant. We don't have control of the Chernobyl nuclear power plant. All guards and all personnel is arrested and kept in, in, uh, uh, as hostages. I will show you pictures about that. Let's go forward. So that's uh, how it began. Uh, that is Chernobyl. You see the map, where is Chernobyl? You see it's very close to Belarus and Russia. It's like actually, uh, actually there is a small city where people who are uh, working on Chernobyl nuclear power plant lives. The, uh, train which carries them to work and home goes through Belarusian territory because that's geography. Uh, so it's so close. So they can do it easily without any problems. And they did it. On the left down corner, that's picture of 1986. Uh, that's a picture uh, that's real uh, from, uh, from data uh, developed after so many years after Chernobyl. So you see what happened when Chernobyl happened. What kind of contamination uh, uh, covered Europe? It was not just for Ukraine. It was not just for Russia and Belarus. Uh, first, uh, Chernobyl reported from Sweden. It was uh, reported that far as Scotland. So uh, now, the world, that's literally the world, because the, this Chernobyl problem uh, it's, it's, it's immense. Soviet Union did almost nothing to uh, uh, cope with the consequences. When uh, we became independent, Russia said, good luck, Ukraine. Uh, we are no more responsible for this Chernobyl issue. Uh, and you can do uh, now uh, on your own. In those 30 years, uh, uh, EBRD, special account, special fund was created, assembly of donors at the European Bank of Reconstruction and Development to cover problems related to Chernobyl. Tens of billions of dollars that was priced stuck on this. The latest one, construction, which covers reactor number four, 1.8 billion dollars. Uh, Belgium French consortium uh, uh, constructed this arc. I was personal representative of the Ukrainian government on the final stage of negotiations between uh, the uh, project management and this consortium. So I know every, every small detail about the project. This is immensely difficult technologically uh, uh, savvy construction because you have to construct it over a reactor which has enormous radioactive level. It has a thousand times uh, higher than Fukushima. And you have to construct it and it must be operational, and some equipment must be operational inside, because what you have inside, immense mass of uh, melted, uh, highly rich uranium with concrete and metal. No, this mess, nobody knows what is going on inside. We have spent 30 years and tens of billions of dollars to instruct, to, uh, to put special equipment, special monitoring system inside this uh, concrete, it, it's massive, it's huge, to monitor because it's hot. Which, when you touch it, it is hot. So the reaction is inside, and nobody knows what will happen. 
to do, the purpose of the project was to cut it into pieces uh, to avoid chain reaction and nuclear explosion. And we were just at the beginning of doing this. And now you have special operation forces. Next slide, please. Oh, sorry, this is not, that's, it will be later. Uh, uh, special Operation Forces of Russian Federation uh, seized this Chernobyl nuclear power plant. They have absolutely no idea uh, how to monitor it and how to manage it. That could be a disaster of epic scale. That's a warning, and I want to report this. As we told you many times, they have, must be stopped now. It's not tomorrow, not in three months, not in a week. Tomorrow, now, because every hour that may happen, when it is our responsibility, we are responsible, but now we cannot control this. So, uh, please, next slide. That is, that is pictures. Again, probably uh, Ambassador of Russia will tell you uh, about uh, Donbass again. Those pictures are from, you see, Radio Liberty, and another one, this is Kyiv. Many of you have been to Kyiv, they saw this church on the water, very famous, and you see smoke. Uh, I drive uh, along this road every day when I'm in Kyiv. It's just between my work and my home. So I know where they hit with a missile. This is Kyiv. This is Podil. This is center of Kyiv. Other part of uh, pictures, you see ballistic, uh, the, you see cruise missile. Uh, and this is what left from this cruise missile, which arrived again right in the center of Kyiv. Uh, we do have, you know, police stations in Kyiv. We do have National Guard stations in Kyiv. Yes, this is normal. So they attack all this. Doesn't matter that those are just modern uh, small buildings uh, around, uh, uh, encircled with residential areas, and they hit them with cruise missiles, caliber. So that is Russian face. That is Donbas. That is how they care about uh, people uh, in Ukraine as. Uh, this creature, I can call, uh, call him President of Russia, uh, uh, say uh, toward Ukrainian people. Next slide, please. That is prisoner of war. We began taking Russians as prisoners. So this one, uh, you see uh, an officer. Uh, we have dozens of them. I'll show you another picture. That is one of them. And then he's questioned by uh, our uh, military. He said, we don't want, we, no, we didn't kill you. I mean, we were not told that we are going to kill you. We were just for reconnaissance mission. You know what? And you see the CNN correspondent, uh, Christian Amanpour, your colleague, reported, this is live. He's looking and Russian uh, uh, soldier in outskirts of Kyiv. It's not center of Kyiv, but uh, in uh, some areas around Kyiv, 30 kilometers around, uh, there is a, an a airport, Hostomel. You know probably uh, Antonov trademark airplanes. You know Maria. That's where Maria lives. Home of Maria, that's Antonov plant and Hostomel airport, which is very close to Kyiv. That's this night, there was 42 helicopters, 200 uh, uh, Russian troops, uh, trying to save this airport. For what? For 100 airplanes coming from Russia with uh, paramilitary troops, uh, which has a goal to, answer, to, to destroy Kyiv infrastructure, to become seizing, you know, c communication systems, governmental buildings, to change the government. Their purpose to change, to see the house, to change the government. It was fair fight. Uh, those, all those were destroyed, Russians, uh, several helicopters were destroyed, and this airport was destroyed completely. So there is no more airport. Uh, I just, I don't know where is Maria. I just pray that Maria is not uh, in Kyiv, because this is unique plane which the world needs. There is nothing uh, similar to, to, to this uh, uh, piece of art. So uh, that's, that's reality. So that's what we have now. And uh, we have like, uh, if you want to go to Donbass, you have to use a train for seven hours. So that's where they look for solution for Donbass. Next picture, please. 
This is, you must have in, in front of your eyes uh, when you will be talking to Russians. Uh, this is the face of uh, a very, very civil woman, very simple woman in a small village, uh, which was attacked by uh, uh, cruise missiles. And again, I purposefully put this to show you from the sources of that. This is an Adolo agency. So it's not my uh, uh, Photoshop. Uh, I am not making those pictures for you. I just make copies of what world agencies report from, from the ground, from d different places uh, in Ukraine. Uh, amazingly, we have very good journalists working on the line uh, of war, and they report it uh, every, every day. So that's, you can just see. Next picture, please. Uh, that's a, a, another one. Uh, that's another residential area. It's another attack uh, in Ivana Frankivsk. Uh, Ivana Frankivsk, this is the city where I visited in December this year. Uh, last year, we have had an ambassadorial conference there. It's western part of Ukraine, uh, Carpathian Mountains, very close to Romania. Uh, it's, I mean, it's like probably 2,000, 3,000 kilometers from Donbass, but there is an airport there, military airport. Uh, so they, uh, we, we have video, I did not include it, but that's a result, we have video when cruise missile coming over the sky uh, and hit this airport. But <clears throat> this is Russian missile. And when it comes to Russian missile, you never know where it goes. So uh, the, those uh, um, uh, cruise missiles, they hit residential areas. And we do have casualties. Please, next slide. Uh, you know this person. Uh, that's how we have to call him from now on. Uh, and next slide. Oh, but we missed something. No, it's not correct. There are, there must be pictures. Please return back. There must be pictures from Chernobyl station. Back. Strange. Possible. <clears throat> I think you made your Sorry, point. Uh, uh, mm. No, but that's important. Uh, they must be there. Okay. Uh, nevertheless, uh, it, I, why it's important uh, to show you, you those pictures? We, we will, I will check now why they're not there. You see military units and vehicles without insignia. Exactly Crimean scenario. So military vehicle without plates with Z on it. That's the same Z they put on tanks. Military units in military uniform with red tape. And again, I have pictures that I don't know why, where they disappear. Uh, it's, uh, it's very strange. Uh, when we, we caught, uh, there are, but on, on my Twitter you can find those pictures easily. They, we, we caught uh, two, uh, military, uh, two military uh, uh, young Russians. Uh, they have, they have under, so they have under their cover, they have uh, insignia of Russia. But then they have like a jacket and they have red tape around it. So this red tape, that's how they designate uh, their forces. So again, imagine that they, they, even if you assume they have had ever any face, now they completely lost it because they always were saying, we, it was not us in Crimea. It, it was, we don't know. Uh, it was not us in the Donetsk and Lugansk. We don't know. But now, officially announced war. There is a statement of war, but still Russian troops moving to Ukrainian territory without insignia. About casualties. This is very important to understand. Because we are very grateful to our partners. We, extremely grateful for, first of all, the United States and Great Britain providing us, who provided us with anti-tank uh, equipment, uh, javelins and NLAX. Uh, we destroyed, I can't calculate, but probably two dozens already of Russian tanks. We shot down minimum, that's exactly, I know, for sure, seven of their warplanes. Uh, a dozen of helicopters. We have killed hundreds of those people. Unfortunately, uh, we do have casualties too, among civilians and the old military. One of the most terrible, uh, that was a, 
um, uh, station, radar station, uh, close uh, to Odessa, on the south, the personnel of this station uh, were 18 people, eight men and 10 women, because it's radar, it's like communication site. All of them were killed, 10 men, uh, eight men and 10 women. Uh, they were killed with missile attack. That is why we continue to request to ask our partners to provide us with additional anti-missile equipment. Uh, we do have some, and we operated, as I told you, we already shot down seven airplanes. This is not small, uh, taking into account that Russian planes are good. Uh, but we still need stingers, we still need additional assistance, because that's where they have superiority. Cruise missiles. This is amazing. I mean, you use cruise missiles in peaceful times, 21st century, around peaceful country, without any provocations, and of course, you never can control. What we expect? That's why I will stop on that. We expect a next wave of attack. They now it kind of regrouping themselves. Uh, we expect attack on Kyiv with. Uh, 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 terrorist units, uh, units specifically purpose of uh, which to uh, seed terror. Uh, it is, uh, there are rumors, I can't confirm, but there are rumors that Wagner Group among them and uh, other uh, death squads from uh, Russian traditions. Uh, uh, and uh, that now, that's why we have now a, a, a curfew installed in Kyiv. That is why now police and National Guard monitors every, uh, every street, every uh, part of the city. And it's not just about Kyiv and Kharkiv, uh, Zhitomir, Dnipro, uh, and many, all, all major cities actually in eastern, uh, central part of Ukraine. Uh, we, we, uh, we, we are ready. We will fight back at every, uh, some cities were caught, like Gidichinsk in the south, close to Crimea. Uh, the goal uh, of Russia, which what we understand now, not just to say Don, uh, to take over Donbas and Lugansk, but to take all the territory of Ukraine, which is has Azov Sea, then south to cut uh, us from the Black Sea, and to have connections to Transnistria. So that was worst case scenario. Until 21st of February, we all were hoping we have light scenario. Probably they will make some activities in Donbass and Lugansk. What now we understand, they went into mass, maximum scenario, the biggest one, using massive forces. We, uh, we estimate that from 90 uh, battalion tactic groups uh, of Russia on our borders, 60 already inside Ukraine. So they still have some reserves. Uh, uh, again, uh, there is no panic. People are very resolved. There is some uh, exodus, I mean, people from, specifically from Donetsk and Lugansk, from those uh, heavily attacked areas, civilians, uh, we, they are trying to leave now to western part of Ukraine. So uh, we have already unfolding refugee crisis. Uh, but it's, not, it's too early to say. What we are now uh, going to do, we are going to fight back. Uh, there is no... Uh, 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 even smallest uh, idea about surrendering, they 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 have now already uh, moving this uh, tune uh, in their propaganda that uh, Russia uh, Ukrainian soldiers uh, gave up, they laid down weapons, and they uh, like uh, we don't want to fight. This is complete nonsense. Let me refute this categorically. This is absolutely com uh, complete nonsense. Our soldiers are fi uh, fighting; they are dying. Uh, and uh, that is enormously uh, uh, terrible burden for us. Uh, we, uh, we ask all our partners to stop this, uh, to uh, impose as harsh sanctions as possible, uh, to prevent uh, a catastrophe of uh, scale unseen uh, since uh, Second World War. Uh, thank you very much for your attention, and now I am ready to answer your uh, questions. Thank you, Ambassador. Thank you very much. Uh, let's uh, start with the uh, questions. Uh, uh, I have a fundamental question. Yeah, go ahead. What do you expect from the uh, United States and the uh, European allies? 
a military intervention? Uh, at this point, we expect uh, supply of additional ammunition for uh, air defense. There we already very well equipped uh, to protect us against tanks, and it works. We have very good equipment supplied by Turkey, Baryaktar unmanned vehicles, uh, 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 UAV, uh, and uh, they are very effective. We already used it. Uh, I saw pictures, uh, how, how they were used, it's amazing. Uh, but we, do, we, do, we, we have no protection against cruise missiles. So that's what we expect, that's number one. Number two, we expect uh, uh, right now, not deliberating again, not deliberations, not in a week, not in a month, but right now to establish as harsh sanctions as possible. Uh, we must remove this villain from Kremlin. This is, <clears throat> this is absolutely unacceptable that one person created such a crisis uh, for no reason. Uh, he must be stopped. Uh, we, we, we are not fighting against Russian nation. We are fighting against regime which is anti-human. Uh, anti that's, that's the subject. So that is why we expect. We know already, I talked yesterday to 28 ambassadors of the European Union and in the EU ambassador uh, herself. Uh, and I understand that the EU is uh, very well prepared. They already uh, uh, announced some sanctions and the United States too. Very harsh sanctions from the Great Britain. That's ex very, very important. <coughs> but we want uh, them to uh, go even further. Thank you. Okay, let's start, uh, Greg. My name is Gregory Clark, freelance. I have visited, visited your country several times. And um, I uh, have great sympathy for what's, what is happening. However, um, Mr. Putin accused you of being Nazification and as an excuse for the war. There is a UN resolution concerning glorification of Nazism, neo-Nazism, and other practices that contribute to the fueling contemporary forms of racism, racialness, discrimination, etc., etc. The voting on this was 130 in favour, 51 abstentions, and two opposed. Of that two, Ukraine was one. How can we explain that vote? I cannot give you details about this resolution. Uh, we have, in the center of Ukraine, we have a place called Babi Yar. This Babi Yar is a graveyard of more than 100,000 people, Jews, Russian, Ukrainians, many nations. Even there are, not my relatives, but there are six people with my family name. I have no idea who they were, but my family name. Uh, they were done by 1942, by Nazis. We lost eight million people in the Second World War. To accuse Ukraine in, for Nazism, uh, this is, from my point of view, the crime itself. We do have right movements, as anywhere else. Those right movements, there are several organizations with a uh, specific vision of uh, uh, policy. They together got 1% on two recent elections. Uh, and we have a saying that the theft screams louder than anybody else. You, there are pictures, and you probably know them better than me, of 1939, 40, 41, when 
uh, Soviet army and Nazis has held parades, uh, shaking hands. Uh, I can share with you, if you don't have it, a, a Pravda, a Gazeta Pravda, a Pravda newspaper picture. Hitler sent his greetings to Stalin. This is completely ridiculous. We have nothing to do with that. We have very vibrant Jewish community. We have uh, open society. And if we have some people who uh, keep their vision as right movements, has nothing to do with Nazism. Uh, Mr. Putin uh, constantly pushes that. That's because it's his own country. There are dozens of Nazi, real Nazi organizations. Uh, people of black color, people from Central Asia, have been killed routine and on a routine basis in underground Moscow, on the streets of Moscow. And that is all uh, very well reported and known. In Ukraine, I would invite you when it will be uh, back to, we will be back to peaceful times, on Vishavanka Day, uh, to Kyiv, and you will see black Arabs, uh, people of all races, of all nations, freely going in Vishavanka, in the center of Kyiv, and nobody ever prosecute them for their race, religion, sex, or whatever. I'm very proud that my country is very open. It's so open, it's unbelievable. Uh, we open to all religions, to all races, and it is unimaginable in our taking into account our history. We have more than 100 nationals living just in Odessa. So that would be my answer to you. Uh, uh, probably this resolution, I have to read it, I honestly saying, I don't remember the text of this resolution. But probably something is inside which, we, uh, which was unacceptable for us. Uh, so it is a kind of separate issue which I would be happy to answer to you uh, <coughs> later on if it's uh, still a point of interest. Ambassador, talking about Odessa, in 2014 there were some very bad uh, uh, yeah, fire. Approach. Yes. Yeah, 50 people died, yes. And those are, if I well remember, Russians. No, Most they were not Russians. No? No. Most of them? That, that was, that was uh, so look, in 2014, in many cities of Ukraine, Kharkiv included, uh, Dnipro included, Odessa included. You remember Novorossiya idea. So mm -hmm. that was all part of eastern part of Ukraine, project Novorossiya created by Surkov and, he, and people like around him. And that was an idea that if uh, 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 pro-Russian people in those uh, cities will make a kind of uprising, a kind of demonstrations, they will seize uh, local uh, uh, government uh, buildings and police stations, they will be armed then and they will make like revolution. They succeeded in Don Donetsk and Lugansk. That is why Donetsk and Lugansk were occupied later. But they were completely subdued uh, in Kharkiv, in Dnipro, and in Odessa. And in Odessa, it was, yeah, it was uh, an attempt uh, to, to uh, put these pro-Russian forces uh, into power. It was a heavy fight between pro-Ukrainian pro youth and pro-Russian uh, uh, pro, uh, pro uh, people. Uh, that resulted in a huge strategy, which is strategy for all Odessa. Uh, and uh, you will see uh, people uh, remembering that because it's, you know, if you know spirit of Odessa, it's very light, it's humorous, it's their people very, uh, very, very hospitable. Uh, and for them, uh, that was terrible tragedy, <coughs> but has nothing to do with uh, whether, whether they were Russians or not Russians. They were, uh, that was a, uh, an attempt uh, to uh, over, overthrow the uh, government, uh, local government in Odessa, and it was uh, a heavy fight, resulted in casualties. But uh, <coughs> we blame, of course, those pro Russian forces. It's 100% uh, their fault. Thank you. Who's next? Jim Bozo. Okay. 
Hi, I'm Teddy Jimbo with the Video News Com, and I'm, I co-chair this uh, committee with uh, PO as well. Um, during the war, it's uh, it's hard to dis uh, determine, you know, who's in which information to believe. So, uh, if we can confirm this one, uh, there was a report that there was a large large scale uh, cyber attack or so called electric el electronic uh, countermeasures against the uh, uh, Ukraine uh, networks. Uh, uh, can you also can, can you tell us first of all if that's uh, it, that uh, what happened if, if actually took place and how large scale it is how much effect that the you know, Ukrainian um, uh, network is now getting and uh, uh, also the potential uh, effect to the uh, the power grid of Ukraine as well as uh, uh, outside of Ukraine that con that that the Ukraine uh, power grid is connected to thank you thank you. Uh, uh, definitely, uh, I can fully confirm that right before the attack, right before the military uh, actions, there was a huge, immense, it, it's not, it was not huge, it was immense cyber attack on Ukraine. Uh, they uh, attacked all governmental institutions, specifically military uh, installments and uh, intelligence. intelligence. Uh, they attacked banks and uh, uh, some... Uh, online services we have. Uh, uh, for, for a while they were not operational, but later on uh, full service uh, was restored uh, and, uh, uh, it, uh, and operational now. That is why you, you are able, but, but if you want, for example, the update, uh, what is going on, uh, you would go to, not to websites of Ministry of Defense or general staff, but Facebook pages. Uh, that's what I urge you. If you read, uh, uh, they, uh, as far as I understand, they, they, they normally put it in Ukrainian and English, the update of what is going on, uh, but Facebook pages. Why Facebook? Because websites were uh, harmed, uh, and we we have no time to 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 do to deal with that. Uh, uh, it, it is clear uh, again. It's not the first time. Uh, it is normal. Uh, for uh, Russian tactics, before the, you, uh, they attack, first you uh, destroy your uh, communication system, then you uh, attack with missiles, artillery, uh, airstrikes, then you move ground forces. So that all, all those components were in place. Uh, right now, uh, some of governmental online services are very restricted uh, because uh, there are a lot of sensitive data. Uh, I will explain it to you. Uh, uh, you don't have this in Japan, sorry. Uh, in Ukraine, we are very open. You have on your phone, you are able to uh, log in to a special service, DIA, and this DIA has connections to a zillion of databases. About all, you can find about all yourself. You can uh, find information about, uh, uh, for example, uh, property, about, I mean, uh, to, to, to get some... Uh, 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 info you need to present somewhere else, etc., etc. Uh, we have intelligence. Yet it is announced, why I'm saying this, it is announced by Chief of Mi 6 British Intelligence on Twitter that uh, there is an intelligence, that there are lists of governmental officials created by Russia which will be eliminated once they take over Kyiv. Family. And we have reports that already some of them were receiving emails saying, you have to work for Russia, otherwise we know your family, we know where you live, we know where you go, and you will be prosecuted. If you would not agree, we will simply kill you. So we, we, we begin to receive those reports again. Uh, that's what I'm saying, uh, that's what I saw in uh, 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 posted by responsible people. Uh, that means that uh, our services, which can be accessed, they can be hacked. Uh, they were severely uh, uh, cut uh, to protect people uh, from, because it could be a mistake, it could be whatever, so we cannot uh, have this luxury to provide the enemy with updated information about our uh, government of officials, military officers, etc., etc., uh, we uh, I, I sincerely hope uh, this is not true. But Mi6 uh, said so. 
Uh, and uh, we must take this seriously into account. <coughs> Good. Ah, power grid. Uh, yeah, we did two things. First, we disconnected diplomatically from Russia, so we, uh, uh, we uh, seize our diplomatic relations with Russia, this is number one, and number two, we cut our electrical connections to Russia, because always uh, the electrical grid of Ukraine was connected to Belarus and Russia. Uh, that was for technical purposes, not because we need them, but because that's how electricity system works. Uh, it, uh, we signed an agreement with the European Union uh, to connect to European grids. And those days, we disconnected from Russia uh, and we tried to uh, maintain our, uh, uh, our electrical grid operational being connected to European system. It is, it is hard uh, because uh, part of our, uh, 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 half of our electricity is gener uh, uh, generated by uh, nuclear power plants. Uh, so if we, they are stopped or they are attacked, uh, it could be consequences. Uh, but we try to, uh, to do whatever possible. Our emergency services, they're working very hard to maintain system operational. Thank you. Karim? Thank you for coming today. My name is Karine Nishimura, working for uh, French Media, Liberation and Radio France. I have a question. Uh, President Macron uh, made a phone call uh, just uh, yesterday after the, the attack to uh, uh, Putin. Uh, what is your reaction? Do you think it's still time to talk with Putin? Uh, I'm not in a position to advise President Macron. He is president of a great country. Uh, and I don't have details yet. I saw the fact that he called uh, Putin. I do sincerely hope that President Macron understands uh, very well what is going on. Uh, we share our all details of what is happening with European partners, with European, first of all. That is, if anything happens in Ukraine, that will be their problem. Uh, uh, so I do hope that uh, he urged Putin to stop this madness. Uh, uh, I don't know whether uh, uh, there is any chance. Uh, President Macron did this several times during this uh, Minsk process, uh, b right before the invasion. Uh, definitely, we, we always support, uh, you probably know that uh, even right before the invasion, President Zelensky made another statement that he called Putin, I mean, so we sent message, he wanted to talk to him. And he was rejected. So that is why, again, uh, I remember when uh, there were years after the 2014 that uh, our Western partners were saying, you, Ukraine, do it, is not doing enough on your side. So uh, now, for those last two years, we have been done a lot to reach out, to try to talk to them, to have multilateral, bilateral, whatever talks, to explain our position. We always were rejected because they have no interest from our point of view. We should not exist. They completely disrespect us. Ukraine is artificially created by Lenin. You know that, right? Like five, uh, 1,500 years ago. Uh, so we, uh, we should not exist. That, that's the point. He hates us. So therefore, uh, any other attempt from a dignitary of this scale, uh, President Macron or Chancellor of uh, Germany or Prime Minister of Britain, uh, any attempt to talk to him and try to reason uh, him, uh, uh, very valuable. Uh, but I'm not sure uh, it will work, unfortunately. What about China? Uh, this is a billion dollar question. <laughs> uh, sincerely, personally, I believe China is not interested in war. Uh, and you know the statement of Wang Yi, uh, Minister of Foreign Affairs, yep. in the Munich conference, who said mm. they are against uh, uh, military actions and they support sovereignty uh, of Ukraine. They did not accept an annexation of Crimea, although they are very big friends with uh, Russia. Uh, this, is, uh, this is obvious. Uh, 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 as far as I know, uh, right now, uh, China keep like silence. Uh, of the situation, I do. Uh, if if I were in a position, I am not. Uh, I'm not authorized to do that. But if I am in a position, uh, I would uh, uh, urge China 
to express explicitly uh, uh, its, uh, 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 its position toward uh, stop violence, stop <coughs> war, uh, uh, come back to uh, uh, remove all the forces and uh, uh, try to work to resolve all your problems uh, in a peaceful way. I do think that image of China uh, as a country of uh, great dignity and uh, this is huge civilization, it's very important for them to keep this uh, stance uh, in Asia and in the world. That is why I do expect that China will be uh, expressing itself. It is very important what China thinks, extremely important. Thank you. Andy, and, and after Rocky, and then. <clears throat> Hi, I'm Andy Sharp from Nikkei Asia. Um, two very short questions. First question, what does the Ukrainian government want from NATO exactly? What, what will really Membership. help? Membership. Pardon? Membership. Okay, well, <laughs> please explain that. And also, you mentioned China yesterday. Um, so you mentioned China just now. Um, China yesterday, the foreign ministry spokesman said, denied it was an invasion. This kind of language surely does not help the Ukrainian situation. Can you expand on your thoughts, please? Uh, but uh, again, you, you, uh, uh, with NATO, uh, you know, it is very simple and clear. What we understand now, and m the more uh, we have uh, war coming, the more we understand. If we are part of NATO, there would be no war. It is axiom. This is very simple. Uh, that is why we were, uh, I mean, if you, I don't want to waste your time take, uh, remembering your history, but first attempt to claim Crimea was done in 2003. Tuzla problem. Uh, many of you may remember, they began to construct a dump toward the Tuzla Island and then actually to cut us off sea. But that was the path toward Crimea. And they were always claiming, with Putin in power, it was not with Yeltsin, but with Putin, it was always that they were saying something on Crimea. But we just thought it is impossible because we have agreements ratified by both parliaments. We have a zillion times confirmed by Russia uh, about uh, the guarantees to territorial integrity and sovereignty of Ukraine. And then 2003, it was a crisis, which was prevented by, at that time, it was President Kuchma, but that was uh, Evgen Marchuk, uh, the prime minister, and uh, if I'm not mistaken, at that time, uh, they, they prevented the crisis. But that was first sign of what is going on. Then it was five years before uh, summit in uh, Romania. 2008. So uh, it has nothing to do with NATO. Uh, as you know, better than me, NATO is uh, uh, defense alliance. Uh, we, as you know, uh, they were protesting against what? A radar in Romania? Radar? Seriously? So you install Iskanders in uh, Kaliningrad, and you, uh, uh, you question radar in Romania? Uh, so, but that's, that's kind of uh, Russian logic. Uh, that is why we're not talking about uh, our right, sovereign right, uh, to choose which alliance to join. We have choice from Putin point of view. ODKB, so new Warsaw Pact, uh, Bishkek agreement actually they call it, or NATO. If, just a, just a question, if we, just imagine for a microsecond, we will apply for membership in Bishkek Agreement. Would they be against it? So that's normal. That's okay. That's because Russia would say, good guy, good boy, okay, come. We will embrace you. That is good. So they can create alliances. We cannot, yes? So this is, this is, there is no logic. There is no brain, there is no logic. They, we want to choose, and we have chosen. And from NATO now, we want membership. We understand all the details, trust me, better than anybody else. We understand all the technical problems, all the military uh, reform needed. We, we all know this very well. But we believe that there is no country in the world which can protect itself by itself. Ukraine is not uh, an exclusion. As you know, Switzerland is a special case, but other countries, they have they must have some kind of affiliation. They have like special arrangements which are not part of NATO. 
uh, but still, uh, with this uh, invasion, you know, even Finland and uh, Norway began to talk about this. So uh, we uh, we don't uh, we uh, we we uh, stay on this path. We want to be part of NATO. And what would you like NATO to do right now? Yes, that's the question. Uh, <laughs> you know, but you know how it may look funny question, but actually. We cannot ask NATO about anything. Uh, we can ask NATO to uh, help us, but we understand we are not part of uh, this uh, Article 5. We cannot uh, request military forces, military protection. Uh, NATO, is, as far as I understand this night, uh, Stoltenberg said the NATO initiated uh, is some plan for Eastern uh, to support Eastern flag of NATO. So I understand additional troops and additional equipment will be moved to Baltic states, to Poland, to this, uh, all our neighbors. Uh, that's good. Uh, we, bo we more rely on bilateral support, uh, as uh, is, is it already pr provided by, uh, first of all, United States and Great Britain uh, and uh, other countries with military equipment that has said, what we need right now, we need anti-missile defense. So whatever small equipment would be quickly moved to Ukraine, uh, it is not to attack anybody, but to protect our uh, uh, civil population, because we expect more attack. Uh, yesterday, four ballistic missiles were shot from Belarus to Ukraine. Ballistic missiles. So it is, it is not a joke anymore. It is, it is not funny. We need this equipment. And NATO as an institution is very supportive. We have constant communications with NATO. Uh, intelligence exchange. This is clearly, uh, this is, uh, you know probably that Ukraine have been uh, for many years uh, the biggest uh, partner of NATO. I mean, we participate in every program available for non-member states, although we're not granted all the <coughs> funny status. Uh, so we want to continue this. Mr. Ambassador, we are running out of time. Can you stay 10 minutes more? Yes. Okay. So, Rocky. Rocky Swift at Reuters. I, I found your description of the Chernobyl situation quite chilling. If that facility is not properly managed, maintained, or, or if it's damaged, what could be the ramifications for Western Europe? Thank you. New, huh, radioactive contamination. Radioactive contamination. Uh, uh, look, you have reactor number four. This is the, it was, construction which has a core with nuclear fuel of highly enriched uranium. And there was a cap on this reactor. This cap was blown during the explosion and what was inside was going outside in air, in very top level of uh, atmosphere. Then you have a wind. And the question was where wind is going. Uh, can we show this map, uh, red map of uh, Chernobyl? Uh, wind was blowing to north. That is why we still have contaminated part of uh, 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 Ukraine, Belarus, and Russia. And on those territories, we still have contaminated land, still uninhabited, still unused for agriculture. Because you can find uh, hot particles, we call that. Uh, actually, small parts of, actually very small parts of highly enriched uranium. So that is the problem. We don't know what may happen. Now, idea was we have to cover it because if you begin to, re to disassemble this mass inside the reactor number four, you will have uh, dust, radioactive dust going to air. That is why ARC was uh, designed to completely cover this reactor. So look at this picture. You see this Chernobyl, and you see where is in Russia contaminated spot. That's because wind was blowing to this direction. If wind at that time would be to south, Kyiv would not be exist at that time. I spent every day of Chernobyl in Kyiv. City was empty. We evacuated all women, all children, uh, and some men. So we were, I mean, that was young. Uh, I was not in a position to leave my job, so we stayed uh, in Kyiv. So I remember empty city of three million people. That's because wind was blowing to the north. 
if wind would be blowing to different direction, that will be huge consequences. But in smaller scale, you see this, this uh, 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 left down picture. In smaller scale, contamination reached as far as Turkey, as uh, Western Europe. And it was registered in Scotland, in Sweden, first. So that is, we don't know what may happen if they destroy this ark. We have no idea because uh, uh, you have to manage it very carefully. People, uh, they have very skilled personnel, specially trained to work on this station. We have been doing this for 30 years. Nobody else knows how to operate it. And for some reason, for unknown reason for us, you have military unit seizing the station, and we don't know what they're doing there. Probably, you may expect, they will announce some accusations towards us, again, which is completely nonsense because we have international personnel, international monitoring system installed by International Atomic Agency. I mean, this is very clear. Uh, it's international project, carefully monitored by the whole world. And uh, by the way, we have here in uh, Fukushima, we have uh, a person who knows every m micrometer of this Chernobyl zone, Professor Mark Zelizniak. He is working now at Fukushima University as professor helping Japan uh, to cope with Fukushima. Anybody wants to talk to him, he speaks English perfectly, he will explain you all zillion details about this. I talked to him about that, and he said it could be, uh, we are not saying it will be, it could be if it is mismanagement. We have now, we lost connection to the people on the station at uh, 8.30 p.m. Uh, Kiev time. Peter. Uh, it's <clears throat> Peter Langen of the South China Morning Post. <clears throat> Excuse me. I'd like to bring the question back to China again. Yes. Uh, we saw um, President Putin in China earlier this month signing an enormous number of new deals with, um, mm -hmm. with China, particularly for energy and gas. And actually just yesterday, China lifted all import restriction on Russian wheat. Yeah. So this is happening as the West is looking at means of sanctioning uh, Russia. So do you have any comments about the role that China is playing in this and the strategy that is seems to be playing out and uh, the future of Ukraine-China relationships as a consequence? Thank you. Yeah, I forgot to answer part of your question about China. Uh, uh, again, look, I would be very careful when we talk about China. First of all, China is the biggest trade partner of Ukraine. Last year, $17 billion trade. For us, it's a big amount of money. China is buying all, uh, a lot of our agricultural products. China has infrastructural projects on our territory. Uh, and we uh, try to maintain uh, work and uh, 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 rational relations with China. Uh, we have China language, uh, cultural centers of China. So we have very normal relations with this uh, uh, state. Uh, we respect it. Uh, at the same time, Definitely, we uh, follow all the developments on Russia-China track. Uh, uh, what is, uh, so uh, there are 26 grades, as if I'm not mistaken, 26, of how China characterizes relations with other countries. There are 26 of them. Uh, number one, very long definition with Russia. You know, there's uh, comprehensive, et cetera, et cetera, relations in new era, something like that. I don't remember the exact uh, formula. Uh, 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 it's it worth noting uh, their statement of February 4, uh, joint statement on uh, uh, a very comprehensive statement. I don't know how many pages in Chinese, but in Russian it's 18 pages. Very unusual for summits. Normally it's like two pages, five points, but 18 pages. And you can find everything. Water on Fukushima, I, AUKUS, accusations to the democratic West uh, imposing democracy on other countries, Taiwan, even NATO. Uh, I checked with uh, people who know China well, much better than me, and they said probably that's the first time China said something uh, about NATO. But there is no Ukraine. <coughs> Isn't it amazing? Uh, from, from my point of view, this is something worth 
thinking about. I do think that China values relations with Ukraine. Uh, we uh, do not see uh, uh, any hostile uh, actions from China side. What we see that China supports Russia in the United Nations Security Council uh, when they vote in the United Nations resolutions. But each time, if you go deeply inside those politics of United Nations, there are many, many details about who votes, why, whom, uh, at certain uh, and uh, because of you know human rights, it's, uh, many issues around that. Uh, we we expect that China would support a peaceful resolution of the conflict. We would uh, very much welcome if China will exercise uh, its connection with Russia and talk to Putin and explain to him this is a kind of uh, inappropriate uh, in 21st century to do this massacre in Europe. I do believe that China invested tens of billions of dollars in One Belt, One Road. As far as I know, the goal of One Belt, One Road, that's European market, $828 billion last year trade. And if Europe is destroyed, Part of Europe definitely is going to be destroyed if that would not stop. And if it will be nuclear contamination of the huge territories, uh, all those efforts to, to uh, work in port infrastructure, Trieste, uh, Piraeus, uh, all this uh, construction of those trade routes to, to Europe, they will be useless because Europe will be different. Refugees, radioactive, war, and whatever. So therefore, I do believe that uh, China can play a much more active role uh, to uh, uh, work with Putin in a manner uh, we expect uh, for civilized countries to do. On energy, it's an extremely interesting question, because uh, uh, definitely that's, that's what Russia does. Uh, uh, it sells uh, energy. It has nothing else. So. They, as far as I know, Putin brought 10 billion dollars, uh, 10 billion cubic meters more to China, so they will be buying now 48. As far as I know, they are developing Silla Sibiri 2, another project from Yamal to China, North Korea, interesting, to Korea, uh, to Republic of Korea, uh, to bring another 50 million cubic meters. I wonder where they will get it. They don't have it. Uh, but probably that will be blackmailing to Europe, Germany about Nord Stream 2, but now Nord Stream 2 is not probably going to happen, and Russia will be doing Asian uh, like uh, direction. It's, uh, I can tell you, uh, I, uh, this is a separate issue worth careful consideration. Uh, but definitely what we, I mean, you know, China bought now, that's another story, a huge amount of coal. That's interesting. Taking into account uh, climate change, green energy and all this stuff, to buy now, as I don't remember the figures, 100 million tons or something, I mean, amazing figure of coal. That's definitely helpful, uh, because if uh, Russia is sanctioned and uh, uh, trade with Western countries uh, are blocked uh, by uh, decisions of different governments, uh, probably they will uh, rely on other markets. Uh, but that's worth uh, separate consideration. We must see uh, uh, what is going on in reality. We cannot uh, uh, avoid the situation when China is the biggest trade partner for 120 countries. <clears throat> for United States, for Japan too, and for Germany. Uh, so this is monster. This is this is super state. And we have to take care uh, and talk to them uh, in this capacity. Uh, and this capacity has many layers. So it is more complicated. And finally, sorry, but I have to say this. I, why I'm very careful about uh, statements from China? Because I do think we must read them in Chinese. Normally, we see it in, the, in a translation, but taking into account specific, uh, very specific language. Probably, we must be very careful when they estimate uh, what they say. We must be very careful uh, of what was said uh, and how it was interpreted. That is why I try not to to pay that much attention to exact wording. I do expect that they have complex of interests, not just one interest or very simple interest. There is many there are many considerations inside the Chinese policy, internal and external. 
Sorry, but yes, Ambassador. Important just question. Just to update you all, I just saw on the South China Morning Post that uh, China has uh, abolished all restrictions of uh, grain. Grain, yes, export. it just was. Yes. Us, yeah. All right. Um, then uh, I have the last two questions from the online. There are colleagues that are following this online. One comes from Ilgin. Uh, uh, Jurl Mats of uh, BBC World uh, Turkish Service. Uh, Ukraine has asked Turkey to revoke the 1936 Montreux Conference Con Conference, yeah. and close both Bosphorus and Dardanelles straight to Russian ships. Can you clarify the reason for your government to do this? Well, yes, uh, uh, the Bosphorus uh, and Dardanelles, so those uh, Turkish Straits, we call it uh, simply. You know, I was ambassador to Turkey for eight years, so that is like what I love, your my, my beloved con convention. Uh, uh, the Montreal Convention, there are, if not mistaken, 15 countries, like Britain too. Uh, all this uh, uh, 1936 story. Uh, Convention manages the traffic in Bosphorus. Bosphorus is a very complicated place. It's very narrow, it's seven turns, some of them like 90 degrees. To manage the traffic, specifically right now, every day, you have 4,000 ships coming through Bosphorus. Uh, every, uh, a, a lot of oil uh, is being exported through Bosphorus. To manage the system, they have installed special, special equipment developed by Northrop Grumman. Uh, and they, uh, like now, work like in operational mode. One day, one uh, some part of the day, one direction, then part of the day, another direction, because they don't uh, want to have con uh, collusion in, uh, in the Bosphorus. But what is the problem with Montreal Convention when it comes to military ships? Military. Uh, Turkey has no right to uh, not to allow passage of military ship for Bosphorus. Uh, the country which would like to uh, do that just inform Turkey about that there will be military ship. The only problem is that if you move uh, a submarine, that Russia did actually now, they have submarines uh, uh, now in Black Sea. Uh, you, they should be uh, on a floating position, so not on, uh, under floor. So they must go, because Bosphorus is 60 meters uh, depth, very, very shallow. Uh, the point is that Montreal Convention says that only restricted tonnage of military ships of non-literal states could stay in the Black Sea and until 21 days. So that means, for example, if British uh, uh, destroyer would like to enter Bosphorus, it can do that if it's uh, proper, I mean, proper amount of this tonnage uh, of the ship, but can stay only 21 days and must withdraw. That is why during all those eight years, we have rotational bases. We have U.S. ship, then French ship, then British ship, then Germany ship, and they come and end, and so they, they visit uh, 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 Bulgaria, Romania, Ukraine, uh, because I mean, the NATO states, Turkey, uh, and that is rotational basis. That is, uh, that is a kind of restriction on uh, uh, heavy presence of Navy from other countries in Black Sea. Uh, NATO countries. If uh, Montreal Convention is abandoned for some reason, uh, NATO would be able to bring fleet to the Black Sea and counter Black Sea fleet of Russia. Right now, Russia, what Russia did, actually it plays uh, Russian Sea, Black Sea. So they now block uh, a huge territory, you know, right before the nation, they block huge territory of uh, Black Sea uh, for uh, military exercises. Uh, uh, so uh, that is the uh, substance, uh, the, the point. But I do remember very well, we talked to uh, Turkey many years about LNG, possible LNG passage through the Bosphorus. And Turkey was very, uh, they were always saying, this is very dangerous, it is true, it is dangerous. If uh, there is an accident with LNG, that could be an explosion. Uh, you have to be very careful uh, with those tankers. So, but when we were talking about this, I remember position of ambassador of Russia to Turkey. And he said, we never, ever, ever agree or any changes to the Montreal Convention, specifically because of this clause 
which limit uh, the tonnage and time of for uh, non-literal states of uh, to be present uh, in a Black Sea. That that is that is the problem. So of course we would love uh, to have this uh, uh, convention changed uh, and to, to uh, allow uh, other, our partners to exercise much more support from the sea, from Navy uh, to us. Thank you. Now the last question from uh, Kaldun Kazari, who is a former president of this club. He works for Pan Orient News. Um, there are some reports in the Middle East uh, that say your president has also Israeli citizenship. What is your comment? <laughs> He's Ukrainian citizen. That's full stop. No, no second citizen. No second citizen. Okay. Thank you very much, Ambassador. And uh, hope to see you again uh, at the end of this. After victory. Well, at the end of the after, after our situation. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Oh, by the way, by the way, hold on, please. Um, I just got uh, an interesting news. Seems that today we will be all very, very busy. So I ask you to bring a tent, uh, stay here, because uh, after the Russian ambassador at two, we will have also the American ambassador at oh. four. Emmanuel Ram just sent a message that he's willing to come. So we will welcome him. Of course, now the only one that is missing is the Chinese, but he's not, <laughs> he's not in the country, unfortunately, I'm told. But we can always... That'd be, that'd be good idea, by the yes. way. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.